so I first of all I wish a very good evening uh, to both of you present here and uh, I am uh, Dr. Sayande and from India and currently I'm working in MIT University. It's a university in Noita where I'm teaching interdisciplinary English. And uh, before I move on with my topic, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to, uh, to you, Professor Leah Rodriguez, and obviously along with other co-organizers who have conceptualized this very crucial and very powerfully decolonial event. Uh, my, I, I was wondering that uh, keeping my various experiences of uh, my praxis, my decolonial activities, my decolonial research at the backdrop, I will uh, talk about the various challenges, the various problems and why most importantly uh, transcontinental decolonization is very important. So my topic is zone of every beam. Yeah, yes, I'll be talking about the various uh, problems of colonizing networks in India and what efforts are being made from India along with across different parts of the globe to establish decolonial networking. So as a part of this South-South uh, uh, cooperation uh, networking. So a very good afternoon uh, to Professor Lee Rodriguez and uh, I am Dr. Sayande and I'll be, uh, I currently work as an assistant professor at Amity University, Noida where I teach interdisciplinary English to the law students. And today I'll be talking about uh, some of the crucial el elements and the various aspects uh, from my own experience with decolonial engagements in India from various dimensions and what are the initiatives that are taken in India both within the country as well as in contacts and networks with various other countries and continents outside. Uh, and my topic is uh, how to establish the zone of every being. We can establish a zone of every being through uh, transcontinental decolonization and uh, border thinking. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll be dividing my, my lecture in, into two halves. The, the first part talking about why this transcontinental decolonization is important from the perspectives of border thinking and secondly, how it is possible. Now, coming to the question of uh, why uh, we need to specifically look into how the colonial empire actually transformed itself in different spaces and different moments of time, especially within the global post-colonial scenario. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we have we have seen actually that uh, you know various scholars across the globe, like uh, you know Gugi. Bakyango and Eru, uh, aviator Zerubabel and uh, Professor Savelo Gatschenin, who have talked about different problems, different dimensions of uh, colonization, like epistemicides, uh, where the knowledge, where the indigenous knowledge systems of knowledge were uprooted, in linguistic sites where the indigenous knowledge were destroyed. At the same time, uh, there were the cultural sites and different types of genocides they have talked about. And uh, somewhere, somewhat, uh, we see that even these problems, these uprootings, these uh, marginalizations still continue in the, in the present era. And that is one major reason why I think just decolonization will not help us, but we need to develop networking. We need to develop systems, various systems to decolonize. And for that, a transcontinental decolonial networking is, uh, is very, very crucial. One important reason. Uh, and the second uh, reason uh, what I was uh, trying to point out is that how <clears throat> the three Ps, which I basically tried to point out, one is the destruction, that is the destruction of our indigenous cultures, indigenous traditions, indigenous histories, lifestyles, habits, education, everything, because colonization was a system, it did not happen overnight, it was a very well strong system. And it came with everything, it came with religion, it came with library, it came with archives, it came with a package. <clears throat> so how this colonial package actually completely uprooted our existence, that is with the destruction. And already I was talking about the various sites, existing sites, culture sites, and Indian sites. The second point which I was talking about, it was not only destruction, the second thing they made sure was deformation. The existing histories, the existing cultural beliefs and practices, they were all deformed. 
they were all restructured they were actually colored in white they were colored in eurocentrism widely later on american centrism and then <clears throat> the typical white male elitist culture was actually imposed across the ex colonies and we still continue today and the last is development this term development i always keep it within quotations because it's very controversial development is actually kind of synonymous to disruptions development comes at a cost development what kind of development is taking place who develops us or who defines the term development that needs to be questioned and that questioning has actually started across the globe but what again we need to strengthen our frameworks our networks and which i think is a very crucial aspect of uh, you know this uh, global south establishing the global south of networks which is actually a very important now talking from the indian perspective we see certain issues indian society was already for example if i take one instance caste now caste was a pre colonial phenomenon caste was never a colonial phenomenon it existed in the hindu scriptures in the hindu uh, various uh, you know hindu uh, texts and contexts but how, if you look how was it politicized or how caste was completely entangled with our regular modes of existence in terms of profession in terms of academics in terms of education we see a major role played by the colonizers specifically the british colonizers who actually brought in caste system within academics who actually brought in caste system in job places who brought in caste race and the skin color in terms of choice of people for various works and activities and even today we see that reflection this is why if we look into the indian academic system briefly and if we see the top notch posts held it is centrally and most of the brahmins whether they are from maybe the brahmins and bengalis or the from various other communities but mostly the top notch posts like the various administrative posts like these chancellors like the vice chancellors and several other administrative posts that the institutions have mostly they are brahmins and this practice dates back from the colonial times now obviously caste system was there but the caste system was in the pre colonial era it was much in a relaxed phase in a relaxed mode of existence there have been instances there were a lot of uh, you know situations where castes were exchanged among people where castes were where people from other castes could play the role of the any different particular caste with if they are able to learn if they are able to spiritually enrich themselves they were allowed but that kind of exchange that kind of net connectivity was totally shattered with the arrival of the colonizers now this is one example and there are obviously innumerable examples which we can talk about with respect to indian system of existence and how the coloniality works in the contemporary era but keeping this time uh, limit obviously at the backdrop i would like to move directly into my second part that why how this transcontinental decolonization is possible now talking about this uh, point of transcontinental decolonization the first point which i uh, proposed is uh, the zone of every beam now we know that franz fanon uh, in one of his monumental works have argued about the zone of being and the zone of non being and how both zone of being and zone of non being are colonially infected how the colonizers force the cultures and the traditions and the communities who have been marginalized in the zone of non being to come directly to the zone of being and within the zone of being they have to function within the frameworks of colonial beliefs and practices and once they function in that colonial beliefs and practices then they are only globally acceptable otherwise they are not so what we need is a situation of zone of every being where which is only possible through border thinking we don't need to look for the center which is still very colonially infected this colonial center with the capital c is very problematic that colonial center with the capital c needs to be dismantled we need various centers we need various cultural centers academic centers traditional centers centers of different types of practices and as a result the the initiatives have already started across the globe that is where we need a deep polarized situation where we are not going to create poles anymore that hierarchy has to be shattered 
and different efforts are being taken. I mean, one big example, you know, is the Latin American Association of Asian Africa, which is actually doing a wonderful job by introducing various kind of networking activities, introducing new speakers, introducing new projects, introducing new books every time, text and context at every moment. Similarly, a few days back, <coughs> Professor Nelson Mandela Torres in South Africa, he conducted a very interesting workshop. In that workshop in one of the African universities, the name of the workshop was actually a creative workshop on leaving the white epistemology outside the door. And that workshop was not just a speech, it was also a per performance, like on leaving the white epistemology outside the doors was divided into five acts, five scenes basically, not acts. And five scenes the actors enacted how to leave the white epistemology outside the door and how to reappropriate our own indigenous beliefs and practices. In India also a lot of initiatives are being taken. If you look into one particular community like the Dalit community, the Dalit community across India are taking some wonderful initiatives to decolonize their scenarios, decolonize their situation. Now, if we look into briefly the history of the Dalits, we see that Dalits were referred to as outcasts. They are not being taken into consideration in any particular class in India. Now, this question of being outcast is again problematic where you don't have any identity. For example, we often refer to the terms whites and non-whites. Now, non-white term might appear a counter argument, but if we look closely into the term, again, somewhere, somewhat, it is our violence. Because if we take out the white term, white from the term non-white, what is left is the term none. So when I am identifying myself as a non-white, somewhere, somewhat, again, I am affiliating myself with the colonial epistemology. Similarly, Dalits have started, have stopped, and questioning the identity of being non being an outcast. They say that we are not any caste, we are not any class. So if you look at the history of Dalits, even if it was have a kind of Hindu-centric origin, Dalits no more exist within any definite religious or class structure. Dalit is right now an ideology. It's a very great example of a deep polarized ideology where you see queers, where you see Muslims, where you see Christians and people from different religious, people with different sexual orientations, they all are a part of the Dalit community. Secondly, we find several initiatives. For example, recently I was in Kerala for a, uh, for a workshop on decoloniality. And there I found a very important initiative by taken by the Kerala, the Kerala government. They organized something like a cultural meetup for the Binali. In every two years, they organize this. The Kochi Banale is basically organized in the in, in the city of Kochi. What happens? They invite artists from different corners of the world, and they come together in natural environment. They set up their artistic works. They don't create it artificially. They are given broken, shattered homes. Those are dilapidated homes. On any day you go to that room, you're never going to visit that home because it's a dilapidated, shattered home. But yeah, at the time of Binale, what happens, they create their artworks with the natural environment. And this time, one of the major themes of artwork was to portray, to recreate artistically, to imagine artistically the pains and the pangs of partition and the refugee problem in India. So some of the artworks was as simple as they have taken an entire room, just to give an example, they have taken an entire room and then spread the entire room with sand. And then the, over the sand, they have put broken houses, they have put broken utensils, they have put broken agricultural objects to show the shattered condition of the refugees or what exactly happened when the partition took place. Because these objects played a crucial role at the time of partition. So this is one another example of how the decolonization is taking place in India at different points of time through so in, in a very in a very episodic manner, which is actually required to identify each and every cultural elements and then decolonize. Because usually what post-colonial elements happen is at the time of post-colonization, we do it, the tendency, usual tendency is to do it in a very generalized manner. And this generalization is again an issue. And similarly, like this, we have this Trump theater project where usually this Trump theater project, they have 
different theatrical activities to decolonize the situation. They usually have theater right into the open space amongst the common audience, where you don't create any hierarchy in the sitting, where you don't create any hierarchy in the ticket prices. And other interesting things that are that is taking place in India is to create the museum of living objects. Where you take real objects from our, where you take objects from a regular existence and you put together for creating a museum. So things are happening, and these kind of projects usually are not only taking place within India. Obviously, a lot of Indian artists within India are taking part, but at the same time, they are also inviting people across the world from different corners of the world. Usually, where artists don't get much chance to globally portray their artistic activities and their ideas and thoughts. So, in a similar fashion, several other activities and networkings are taking place, collaborative projects, collaborative artworks, collaborative academic works, exchanges, which I think are a crucial, a very crucial component of this South-South networking. And, uh, I mean, obviously, with this workshop, I believe that uh, this particular networking process is uh, actually going to help us to enhance our connectivities, our combinations, our uh, cultural artistic exchanges further. Thank you so much.